Okay, so today we're going to be talking about act two of the Watto arc. And I'm not gonna lie to you, this is probably what feels to me like the highest stakes review I've done in a while. Just because, oh man, there's so much that happens in this act, in these 30 chapters. There's so many moments where Oda used my heart as a punching bag, as well as so much set up for things to come and a lot of foreshadowing, a lot of theory fodder. Really, this video could go on for hours. I just don't have it in me to be here for hours. Eventually, my throat starts hurting and so does my head. So I gotta condense. And it's hard to decide what to condense. So what I'm gonna do is there will be parts of these chapters. This is honestly, this is Wano Act 2. I've mentioned several times that I'm not fully looking forward to being caught up week to week because I love reading the story as I've been reading it. But this is the first time where I read through a section of the story that I'm like, yeah, reading week to week would be kind of nice to be able to break down and really zero in and focus on stuff for a really long time. This act needs it. <laughs> So what I'm gonna do is there will be smaller details of the arc that I'll breeze past, I may not even mention. It's okay, you've read it, you know, you know what's here, right? So I really wanna spend a lot of time digging into the characters and the moments that meant a lot to me. And I think it's too early for me to probably be discussing themes. I, I knew from the start, I could tell that this was going to be a theme heavy arc and that has really, it really seems like it is. <laughs> that seems to be very apparent at this point. It's probably too early for me to be discussing themes, but I might touch on it a little bit because Oda's doing a lot here and it's taking a lot of setup, but I'm really, really enjoying the setup. But before we get into this way too long review, an ad from today's sponsor, Bright Sellers. Don't skip it. I bought the outfit. I gotta wear it more than once. I. Corona love relaxing with a glass of wine after, let's say, filming a two-hour video. The problem is, I have no idea how to pick out wine at all. I usually just go to a shelf, grab one that looks good, and then don't like how it tastes. Which is why I'm excited to be working it's embarrassing. Which is why I'm excited to be working with Bright Sellers because they match you with wine all across the world curated to your palate. All you have to do is take the quick seven question quiz where they'll ask you things like what your favorite chocolate is or how you drink your tea so that they can gather your taste preferences and then they'll curate a box completely unique to your taste palate. They send the box directly to your home which means that you don't have to embarrass yourself by studying the shelves for a long time and then just picking the one that looks prettiest. And each box comes with wine education cards which outline the tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperature, and origin. And what I really liked about it is I have a lot of food allergies. So when I was matched with my wines, they actually showed me what wines I was matched with and I could choose to have one of them taken away and replaced with something else. They're still choosing what else it's replaced with, but now I'm not stuck with a wine that I can't even drink because I of allergies. This would also be really beneficial if you happen to be a little bit picky, but you just want to venture outside of your comfort zone. If you are matched with something that you know you're not going to like, you can have that replaced. And if you use the link in my description, you get 50% off of a six bottle box. So that's six bottles of wine for $53 plus shipping, which is a really good price. And by trying out Bright Sellers, you're supporting me, which means that I get to buy more wigs because I've somehow lost the ones I wore last time I dressed as Perona. So if you enjoy wine and you wanna try things outside of your comfort zone, or if you think you enjoy wine but you don't know how to buy it, like me, try out Bright Sellers today. I've been very happy with the selection they sent me. Anyway, the arc opens up with, once again, that, zone, that zooming out, being able to see what's happening in the wider world. We have Blackbeard announcing us to, that the Battle of the Thrones has begun, which of course was set up in Rivery. I assume this is what he's talking about. You know, the one throne that no one sits on, that actually the shadow figure sits on. He is here announcing to us that this battle has begun. Obviously, of course it has Blackbeard. We don't need you to tell us. We have Perona letting us know that uh, Moria is alive. And then we have um, Mihawk telling us that, what did he say? An odd subject has arisen at the rivery. By the way, new camera that I'm filming on. Do you see this? Look at that autofocus. 
that's amazing. I'm sorry if the colors are wrong. We're working on the color temperature still. So I don't know what's going on in the rivery. I wish someone would tell me because I gotta, I gotta be honest, I'm dying to know. I feel like Oda set us up for something catastrophic to happen there. And I know I have to wait a long time to find out because Oda makes me wait a long time to find anything out. But I just wanna know and Mihawk teasing me was rude. And probably my favorite thing about this chapter was uh, that Absalom, I thought he was, it was another fake out death. And I was, so, cause pretty, I'm pretty sure at some point someone mentioned that Absalom died off screen, right? And that was wonderful news. And then, and then here he is, and I was so mad. And this was the best fake out death ever because it was a fake out life. And turns out he is dead and it was just, it was, I felt great. I felt great about this news. Anyway, we open up Wano with Ashura. I'm trying really hard this time. Okay, so I guess side tangent. I have a terrible memory. We all know this. I especially have a terrible memory with names. I don't know what it is about me. I'm bad at remembering names. We all really know this. Now that I can't put panels on the screen to speak for me, I'm trying super hard to take notes of names and to learn pronunciation and to be able to communicate well with you without the images. So we open up with Ashura and Dogstorm in this combat. And I'm not gonna really comment on this at the moment, but I just wanna take note of it because Ashura is one of the characters that stands out to me the most in this entire arc so far and in this entire section so far. I should have said section then arc so that it didn't go down. He's one that stands out to me the most and he's a character that I really, really love. Um, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna make note of the conflict. But I also wanna briefly talk about uh, Luffy in prison. So obviously we left off with Luffy being captured and imprisoned. Him competing with Kid about who does the most, who works the hardest, who gains the most meal cards, and, uh, and, and their childish bickering is hilarious and I don't I think I said at the at the end of the last review that I think that Luffy and Kid are gonna team up I still see that I still see it coming out of it they've had too much of a of a good-hearted camaraderie and not camaraderie a good-hearted rivalry between the two that it's gotta evolve into something plus them fighting together is Great. When Hippo Guy is beating up on on Hiyo, Hiyogoro and Luffy and Kid team up to easily take the man down once again, you're told that if you attack a prison guard, what, you die? Is that what that penalty is? One is cut off an arm, cut off a leg. I'm pretty sure you just die if you attack a prison, gu prison guard. I'm not positive though. Either way, they know the consequences, doesn't matter. He needs to be beat up. And these two working together to take down someone who is suppressing so many people is wonderful. And I just, I know we're not done. I know that kid bailed on us at the end of part two, but I know we're not done. Oh yeah, and Swampy is here, which I'm not happy about, but I understand that ugh, Caribou, I have to use people's real names now. Caribou is here, which I'm not happy about, but I understand that he's one of the few people that knows that Princess Crybaby, whose name I don't know, is um, uh, is an uh, ancient weapon. <laughs> He's one of the few people that knows that she's an ancient weapon. He actually has a lot of knowledge that we really don't need him to know. He's significant, and I understand that Oda has to keep him around. Plus, we had like a million year long cover story following him. I understand he has to be here, but I don't like him and I don't like the way he wears his sleeves. One little moment that I really liked is when uh, when the guys come to harass Sanji at his sopa shop and Sanji takes them down and then this panel where he's shoving food in their mouth and he's like, eat it, eat the food you wasted. And then of course, this is where we meet Toko. Toko, who is just a delight. I love her so much. Also, as we were talking about Kid, I just had to get up and leave, so I don't actually remember what the last thing that I said was, but I was probably talking about Kid. And as we're talking about Kid, I also wanna mention that he says at one point, well, they're talking about him battling Big Mom, and he says that he never battled Big Mom. All he did was wound one of her generals and take what he meant to take. What did he take? Did he also get a rubbing of the glyph like Brooke did? Or was he taking something else? Was he taking a person? What did he 
do. Also, he battled Shanks. <laughs> Who is Kid? I must know. Also, another little moment that I, that I really loved was with Old Man, <sighs> Old Man, what's his name? Hiyogoro, with Hiyogoro, Hi Hiyogoro, with Hiyogoro, Luffy gave him some of his meal tickets. Obviously, he is too old and weak to be able to hand, to be able to do the the labor, and so Luffy gives him some of his meal tickets. Which Luffy, the glu the glutton, the one who can eat all night long for eleven hours straight, in fact, and still fight a battle. The man who is never satisfied gave away some of his meal tickets. I've actually never seen him do this before. I've never seen him. I feel like that's a different level of selfless, selflessness for Luffy, you know? He is constantly being selfless, but when it comes to food, he's a glutton, and he always has been. But in this instance, without thought, and really without too good of a reason, I mean, yeah, the guy was hungry, but without thought, he's just like, yeah, of course you can have some of mine. I have plenty. When has Luffy ever said, I have plenty, come eat some? I mean, it's not like he takes from the mouths of others, but he he doesn't typically say, here I am eating, here, have some food. This is also the chapter where we meet Hiyori, Momo's sister. And I, it's interesting because she had such a misleading start, right? With her conning these men out of money, telling them that she is a slave to her owners and that she uh, needs money in order to buy her freedom. And then these men give her money and then she says, I don't need any of that money. Actually, I've already spent it all. I'm fine. Get out. And then they're kicked out of the capital to live um, in the slums because they can't, because they've given her everything. And, you know, you can assess, you can assume that these men probably aren't super cool because one of them sold his freaking family to get her, to buy her freedom. So he sold someone's freedom in order to gain her freedom. So probably he's not the best, but also, I need to know more about this. I'm gonna need more of her beginnings. She also, when we first meet her, she says, to me, a man is nothing but a dog that fetches me riches. I only have scorn for the poor man. These are not things that endear me to her. Naturally, I like her much more as I've spent more time with her, but still, that beginning, I wonder why, and I'm gonna need more light shed on that. However, I did assume from the beginning that she was Momo's sister just because of the structure. A lot of times when Oda reveals stuff, the way he sets it up is he will uh, make that person the focus of the chapter, and then at the end of the chapter, he'll be like, also, something and like those two things are connected so in this instance it was her introduction and then at the very end of the chapter we had momo saying my sister's identity is probably a secret now but i must find her and protect her and it's like okay well those are you know connected and i have to say yatsui isn't a character that i yatsue he's a character that didn't stand out to me a ton initially i really he wasn't on my radar at all and as a suspicious reader as someone who looks at every single character and it's like what significance will you play for whatever reason he slid under my radar and i wasn't expecting a lot from him but as i was going through my notes and trying to refresh myself on all the things that happened and i reread his scene his opener with zoro which was hilarious the first time and kind of devastating the second time, seeing him put on that front and trying to get Zoro to act the same way. And uh, it all, pretty much everything in act two hits different. As I look back through the panels and as I'm trying to collect my thoughts, basically everything hits different after context. But I guess that's the series, isn't it? CP0, who used to be CP9, now is CP0, meets with the Shogun and it turns out that Mingo being removed from the equation has disrupted things terribly. And now CP0 is here to try to get some of the weapons that, that the Shogun is, that, or it doesn't matter, that the Shogun is, is forcing his residents to, to make, and, and this is why this world is so industrialized, and this is lar a large part of why this world is falling apart so much, Wano, specific, no, that this country is falling apart so much, although part of it is just that 
the extreme, it's kind of similar to the toe jams where you have the extremely wealthy that live these lavish, extravagant, wasteful lives and then they have, and then you have the rest and there's really not an in-between. It's this massive social gap and the rest are starving and abused and hopeless. And then you have the indulgent, excessive, thinking they're better than everybody else, right? You have this massive social divide in Wano. And the Shogun is uh, it's continuing to create these weapons. And now without Mingo, the CP0 are here directly with the Shogun trying to bargain for more weapons. And Shogun says, I asked for a battleship this time, was it? Next, I want um, Vagapunk. I don't even know what to do with that. I don't... I don't even know what to do with that. And then them saying, well, you know we can't do that. And then Shogun basically saying, you will. There's there's such a shift in power that's happened by removing Mingo. And I don't know the extent of it yet, but Oda's building to some really big things. And then we see more of the worst generation with X Drake and Hawkins show, just Drake. Drake and Hawkins showing up that they have pledged their allegiance to Kaido and Duh, there's a lot more with that. But anyway, they're after Sanji. I definitely thought that Sanji, with how adverse he was to using the Transformer device thing, I definitely thought he was gonna hold out a lot longer <laughs> before he started using it. But it was really cool to see it in action. It has a great design, it has very cool powers, even if Sanji abuses them sometimes. And I gotta admit, I do love the name Soba Mask even if everybody else hates it. And then we also get the whole bit about Big Mom showing up, her getting knocked into the water by King, who is a character that I'm very excited to learn more about and to get more from. I don't know. He looks cool though. And also I really love the power dynamics of Kato's Ka of Kaido's crew. I learned how to say it now. I really like learning the power dynamics about Kaido's crew. I appreciate seeing Jack, who is some, yep, definitely Jack, not Tom. Jack, who is somebody who is really important and who seemed extremely powerful when we were on Zo. We now see him being mocked by the rest of Kaido's crew and him being um, a lesser threat among them. But anyway, King knocks mom into the water. She gets washed up with Chopper and his section of the crew or his section of the people that we're with. And she has amnesia. Of course she does. She has amnesia. It's fine. Everything's fine. I have a lot of opinions on this. I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm not gonna talk about them here. I will talk about them in the video, just not yet. Cut back to the Shogun. We got Robin doing some spying and then caught, but it was a hologram. That's not the word she used, clone. It was a clone. Um, and then we have the Shogun doing his due, falling in love with Momo's sister. And then of course we have Toko busting up, laughing at the Shogun. Now this is one of those scenes that just really, really gets me upon as I look back at the, at the chapters and I know more, it just hits real different. At first it's like, ah, oh, this quirky weird kid can't hold in her laughs, it's fine. Weird, but fine. But now we know that, now we know why she can't help but laugh and it's because basically, basically he did this to her because her poverty and her, and her sadness and her moaning and her grumbling tummy was too annoying to him. And he wanted people to laugh and smile. And so he forced this on them, which we haven't actually discussed. I'm now discussing things out of order, but this scene hits different knowing the context, knowing that he did this to her, but because now her laughter, first, her sorrow, not her, but her people, first the people living in poverty, their sorrows were too, annoying to him. He didn't really appreciate it. It wasn't glamorous enough. It didn't fit with the idea that he had in his mind of what Wano should be. So he poisoned them. He forced them to remove their ability for sadness and for grief and for anger, I'm pretty sure is what was removed. And he forced them to have to smile and laugh and show a false joy because their sadness and their and their pain and their desperation and their starving, it, it didn't look pretty enough for him. So he forces this curse on her 
to be to have to smile to have to laugh to have to have this false joy then when that joy is inconvenient to him he wants to kill her he wants to kill her because now that joy looks like mockery and how dare she how dare how dare that joy that he forced on her be an inconvenience to him we have more to discuss with the shogun but honestly like He's one of the most evil ones that I've come across yet. So because the curse that he put on her is now inconvenient to him, he wants to kill her. And Hiori stands up to him and tells him, what was it? She slaps him. She says, I refuse. I do not grovel before anyone. Oh, and Robin, who is amazing, who was also in the palace, saves Toko, rushes off, doesn't even know if she can actually succeed at this because this whole situation seems a little bit impossible, but she's gotta do what she's gotta do. She takes the kid and she's running out of there. Basically because Brooke is incredible and because Robin is incredible, Toko makes it out alive. It really is, it really is a testament to Oda's writing that Brooke, who was a character that I really didn't care about at all, and in fact, I didn't really understand why we needed him to join the crew because again, as I said in a previous review, we already have a swordsman and we already have a perv. So what exactly do we need this skeleton guy for? I mean, he was a great character that showed up for the sake of what we got out of him in Laboon, which yes, that's, that video is still coming eventually, probably once I'm caught up. I, lo I love what he offers to the story, but why do we need him as a crew member? And now it's so flipped to the point that when Brooke shows up, I'm like, oh, okay, we're safe we're good. We're going to make it out of this fine. But anyway, the roof cl collapses in, she gets out of the jaws of the Hydra, and then, oh, what's his name? Kaishiro. I want to, I want to make super clear that I'm really bad at names, and when I'm finally trying to learn names, <laughs> it happens to be in Wano that I make this decision where all the names are so much harder. It's no Tom anymore. Kiyoshi Ro is how they told me to pronounce it. So, Kiyoshi Ro. Kiyoshiro kills her, which we know that she makes it out alive and we don't know how. And I will note that he asked her before he killed her, killed her, pretended to kill her, are you ready? And she said, I am. So, I mean, he did say you've made a mess of this, haven't you? And it is definitely possible that it was like an antagonist, like kind of like teasing his prey before he killed it and being like, are you ready to die? And then this is just her still standing strong and saying, I'm ready. And then, I don't know, maybe she was injured and she crawled away, but I don't think so. It does seem like, it does seem like they were in cahoots. And so I really do wonder about Ki Kiyoshiro. I do wonder about Kiyoshiro because he's clearly... The Shogun's, is he the Shogun's number two? Head of guard? I don't remember his position exactly. He's clearly very important to the Shogun. He has the Shogun's trust. He is significant and he's working for him. I mean, he blocked that when, when Zoro was trying to kill him later, he blocked it. I don't know. I just have my eyes on him. I just wonder, he got a really cool character design and I don't no, he does seem really loyal to the Shogun, but he also seems like he's working with Momo's sister. I also want to note Nami's panel here. I've kind of skipped over Nami's plotline up to this point because I, I don't really know what's happening with it, if I'm honest with you. There's a lot of like little pieces of things where they're spying on stuff and we're getting little information and not a lot of it has had any payoff yet. So we just don't have a lot to say about it at this point. But this panel where Nami calls upon Zeus, who I completely forgot we even had, and uh, lights up the place, that was a great panel. Oh yeah, and after all of that goes down, Brooke admits to us or tells us all that, by the way, I found another glyph. I mean, like, truly, Brooke, who are you? And why did I not realize how incredible you were until now? Cutting back to Luffy, this is where Hyogoro is being beat up again. Luffy defends him again. And we're introduced to Queen. And boy, oh boy, do I love 
queen. He is evil, he is terrible, he is ruthless, but he also dances, he's super groovy, and he's a dinosaur. So I love him and I hope that we get a lot, a lot, a lot more of him. We also get that really funny scene where Luffy uh, takes down a million guards and then Queen is like, go ahead, tell me the, the top three things that you're worried about right now. And it's like, this prisoner escaped and Someone's stolen the sea stone cuffs, uh, the, the the key to the sea stone cuffs, and also now L Luffy's escaping right now. <laughs> and it's just, there's so much humor around Queen that just makes me really, really happy. What also makes me happy is seeing the very clear level ups with Luffy. Again, I'm new to manga, so there's a lot that I don't know about like how characters are supposed to level up or whatever. But the first time when Luffy went from gear one to gear two, to me, I mean, maybe this is just my inexperience as a reader and not knowing what to look like, but to me, it looked really abrupt. To me, it looked like Luffy just needed to power up, so he did. And now I feel like I see so much of Luffy of, of his experiences, and not just Luffy, I see this with Zoro too, I see this with Sanji, but I see so much of the experiences that these characters go through contributing to them leveling up, and it's, it seems like a very, very distinct choice that Oda is making as he's doing this stuff. So like, for instance, there's obvious stuff like Luffy and Zoro both when they face off against something and their response is, oh cool, so once I get through this, that means I'll be stronger, right? But then you also see his level up things happening, you see where he gained them. Like for instance, uh, during the fight ring, which we haven't even gotten to, when Luffy tells the old man to duck and then he ducks and then the, the old man's like, oh, it's like you could see into the future. And um, there are so many things like that where Luffy is fighting and you can see you can pinpoint exactly where he learned that thing, and Zoro as well, and I think Sanji too. I'm not thinking of it right now because I'm specifically thinking about when Zoro takes the sword and his whole arm just dies a little bit, and he's like, ah, but when I learn how to wield the sword, I'ma be stronger. But anyway, in the midst of all this, Razo has been sneaking through the prison, trying, he stole the sea stone cuff keys, and he's been trying to find the cuffs to Luffy. It's not been working out super well for him, but one thing that he has accomplished is the dark, scary figure you're in the cell that I haven't even mentioned up to this point, he happens to walk past and he says, I'm Kawamatsu, is Momo alive and well? And I just really like that gag of them just putting like a towel over their head and then they're disguised. In fact, I just really like Razo in general, his giant big ninja presence that just puts a towel over his head and he's like, inconspicuous. It's just, it's a great gag and I'm, I'm happy about it all the time. But I wanted to mention this thing because I love the entire role that um, Razo plays and how it doesn't go as I expected it to. It wasn't, he didn't save the day like I thought he would, but he was still really instrumental. And I also really love how surprised I was about Kawamatsu. Yeah, Kawamatsu, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right how surprised I was at Kawamatsu's character because, you know, he's this looming dark guy that gets fed the poisoned fish, but he's not dying, and then somebody didn't take the bones out, so he killed the guy with the bones, and, you know, it just, he seems like he's this looming evil figure, and I don't, I don't know what he's gonna be, but he's gonna be something bad, and then he comes out and he's a frog. But then he actually ends up being one of my favorite characters of the arc so far if not my favorite, but we're gonna talk more about him. I'm telling you, these 30 chapters, even as I'm breezing past a lot of things, just mentioning them and moving on, there's so much to discuss, and I haven't even really gotten to the parts that I wanna dig into that much. Anyway, I'm gonna skip past the bath scene because I think it's dumb and I hate it, but they did mention Hyog Hyogoro, and I don't know who he is, if it's someone that I should know of, if it's someone that we're just planting some seeds about and he's about to come into the picture and be more important. I really don't know about this character, but I assume it's someone that's coming into the picture eventually, maybe? Anyway, then we get into the fight, fight ring with Luffy, and I really, really love the scene where um, Queen is explaining the rules of the fight ring, which is, I'm gonna put this collar on you, and if you leave the ring, it's going to behead you, also, you're required to continue fighting until you're knocked out of the ring. I will continue sending oppon opponents at you until you're dead. The end. 
now I'll take these sea stone cups off of you because it doesn't matter because you have this explosive collar around your neck. And Luffy's like, wow, you took off my cuffs. You must be a real nice guy. And Green's just like, did you forget about the collar that I just told you about? It's just like, it's, it's just peak humor. As much as I love Luffy, like that dim-wittedness that comes up sometimes and then people's reaction to him of just like, is this kid serious? And then I also just love Luffy easily taking out these people that should have killed him and him just being like, okay, next. And he's like, just happy to be, happy to be sparring, happy to be getting stronger, happy to be <sighs> fighting and testing his skill. And through that, we end up having such amazing moments between Luffy and the old man. Give me a moment to look at my screen again. Hyogoro. Between Luffy and Hyogoro, we've got, we get so many great moments of them in this fight bonding as Luffy is protecting him and then him realizing that Luffy has what it takes, that he has the abilities that Rayleigh has begun with him and so he starts teaching him and at one point even turns his back and says, all right, Luffy, take care of this. And it's like, if I mess up, you die. And he's like, cool, don't mess up. Um, you know, Luffy being able to take the collars off, just like, I, him beginning to train Luffy a little bit, his trust in Luffy, and then of course we find out the significance of who he is and who he once was, and I just, I really like his character too, a lot. Anyway, in the midst of all this stuff that's happening with Luffy, we also have Zoro fighting with this Monk character, um, and, and I really like the line when Monk, when, when Zoro, uh, says, I'm pretty sure your weapon collection is going to a new home. I love his confidence. I love his uh, faith in his ability in a fight. But anyway, through that, we also learn more about the sanctity of his blade, the one that he won off of the Wano samurai back when he was fighting. I guess Moria, I guess Moria dug up the corpse, must have done when he was in Wano, probably when he was trying to become the Pirate King. And, uh, and he then brought and back to Thriller Bark. And so anyway, when Zoro fought against that samurai and won the sword off of him by defeating him, now he's in Wano and everybody thinks that he committed the crime of stealing the sword, but like, it's mine, it belongs to me. He's very stubborn about that. But anyway, we learn more about the sanctity of the sword. We learn more about how, you know, robbing a grave of the sword is how big of a deal that is here. But then we also meet a mystery man who they think I think Zoro thinks, nope, Momo's sister thinks, you're an assassin of Orochi posing as a criminal, aren't you? Now, I don't think he is. I don't think he is. I don't think he is. Because this is killer, we now know, which was just such a, I didn't see it coming. <gasps> so this is killer, which this whole scene is different to me now. And so sad seeing this man come up trying to kill Toko and laughing his whole way through it. And it just makes me want to cry because I know that one, he hates, he hates his laugh and he doesn't want to laugh. But two, he has no choice. And three, he probably doesn't want to kill Toko either, is my guess. What did he do to him? I really like killer. He was one of the worst generation that really stood out to me because I really liked his design. But anyway, so anyway, he shows up and Hiori thinks that, that, um, the Shogun, that he is one of the Shogun's assassins, which I mean, yeah, probably so. He seems to be under his control at the moment, but he's also Kid's right-hand man. And what, what did he do to him? You know, like what did Orochi do to him? I mean, I know that he fed him a false smile fruit, a defective smile fruit. And the thing is, and we aren't here yet, but the thing is Shogun, the Shogun, Orochi's method is he wants everyone to submit to him. He wants the best, he wants the greatest, and this is what Kato says too. Ka Kaido. This is what Kaido says too. He wants the best. He wants the greatest to, um, to work for him, to be his subordinates. And him taking Killer and what I assume is breaking his will somehow to force him to work with him. I don't know. I guess, I guess just seeing, seeing kids grief at seeing the condition that Killer is in 
I guess it's kind of affected me. So now I look back at that scene and like, it disturbs me, but I don't even understand the fullness of what's happening here. But anyway, Zoro decides to offend Kyori, defend Kyori and uh, Toko, and he fights off Killer, which was great. I really liked that scene. And, and now it looks like Kyori is really into Zoro. She seems really interested in the guy. And he, of course, couldn't be bothered, but he develops this really sweet relationship with Toko as he defends them and as he tries to take care of them. He's been wounded, but that's his own fault for being weak enough to be wounded. I love Zoro. Okay, so we finally arrived at the Yatsui chapters where he's crucified. And again, I didn't really expect anything out of this character, but he's Toko's dad. Toko, who is working for Kiori, has been sending rations back to him, but he's not been using them. Instead, he's been supplying food to the people who are hungry, who are starving. Um, I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, he never actually ate a smile fruit. He just puts on the smile as just to be a part of the other people, to, to not be different from them, to show camaraderie with them, I guess. And he lies about being the Witching Hour Boy. I don't know who the Witching Hour Boy is, the Robin Hood. I don't know who he is at this point. I don't think I'm supposed to yet. But anyway, he lies about being that so that he can be crucified, so that he can let everyone know who he is. And honestly, there's so much wrapped up in, into this scene. Forgive me if I, if I miss some of the significance of it, but he is here to announce who he is, which he's someone extremely important, my goodness. He's someone who matters to a lot of people. He was the one that convinced all of Odin's select crew, um, Foxfire and Razo and the bad painting guy and um, the shadow guy in the prison, it's basically everybody significant to Odin. He's the one that convinced them to get their lives together and who like really pushed them. But he was also a really important, significant figure to the people. And in fact, Odin at one point was, figured that he would be the next Shogun. He would be the one to rule the place because he was so beloved. But instead he convinced Odin to get his own life together and he pushed him to be who he knew he could be. He basically took the fall for all the people who had the tattoo signifying their um, allegiance to Odin who had been imprisoned. He cleared their names essentially, but not only that, he also really shook the ground beneath the Shogun by um, calling him out by showing his hypocrisy, by making it so that the guards wouldn't even be able to fully trust in him or want to defend him after this moment. He kind of, he basically, like I said, he shook the ground underneath the Shogun's feet and, uh, and, and made everybody pause and, and think about who they were serving. Then, not only that, but he invoked the ire of the Shogun and, um, and he killed him. And I knew he would. It was obvious that that's what we were doing. I knew he was gonna die here, but still that line where he said, forgive me, Otoko, forgive your father for leaving you behind. I expected him to die, but man, I didn't expect a line to hit me like that. I mean, I, I had prepared myself for his death, but I still ended up being really emotional over his death because of that line. But anyway, the Shogun then um, came running through the crowd or rather was shepherded through the crowd and, and shot him in front of everybody. And, and that martyrdom, that death, him being killed in cold, cold blood by the Shogun in front of everyone and then everyone was left laughing was such a stark moment of people not really being able to deny what's been done to them. Everyone realized that the person that was being crucified in that moment was someone that mattered to them, someone that they loved, someone that they didn't want to die, and then watching the Shogun kill him and then being forced into laughter, being denied the right to grieve, I think is probably the most um, impossible to deny display 
of the state that they're truly in. So anyway, I've kind of already touched on it, but these smile fruits are a lot more devastating than I really thought they were. Um, you know, they have a really low success rate. I think it was like 10% success rate. Uh, and then the people that are successful in getting the smile fruit, they get to have their kind of wonky zone type abilities. Uh, and then if they're unsuccessful, then they're cursed with this, as, um, as Momo's sister put it, he plunges people into misery and then leaves them unable to mourn. If this isn't hell, what is? Contrasted with him saying, oh, I'm gonna make you feel like you're in heaven. I'm gonna make this look like heaven. And then on top of that too, the fact that he comes rushing in, most leaders would want bodyguards, would want their men around them, but he comes rushing in with really hardly, I mean, technically the lead of his guard was there, but he didn't have that much protec protection around him. And when Zoro attacked him, his shock at, at that somebody would dare to attack him, this man, this man who the defective smile fruits, the ones that don't work, the ones that put this curse on people, he feeds them to the poor and they're aware, they become aware of the curse that's on them, but they're so hungry, they're so starving that they can't deny their stomachs the food and they take the curse on themselves just to stop being hungry. He knows he's put his people in this state and yet he, in, he treats his people as experiments and he puts this food on them so that they'll stop mourning and they'll stop whining so that they'll be happy to be in their desperate state. And then he's so proud that he says, this is some kind of paradise, this is some kind of heaven. And he's shocked that anyone would dare attack him. This man, and as if I've not been punched enough in these chapters, Togo comes running to her dad and says, don't worry, I have good medicine that'll bring you back to life. And it's because of Usopp's toad oil that he was selling. She, she believes him and she tries to revive her dad. And then the Shogun sees the girl who laughed at him, who stole the love of his life from him, and he tries to kill her too on top of everything else, which I'm out of order now because I already talked about Zoro attacking him. But I gotta tell you guys, this one single panel where both Sanji and Zoro come to defend her, and you've got Sanji in his, in his signature pose with his foot on fire re ready to defend this girl that he only met one time, and then Zoro, squatted down with her, her little head in his chest, defending her. I burst into tears at the sight of this, of these two guys taking her in their arms and defending her from the Shogun. Anyway, let's snap back to Killer. Again, I'm talking about things really out of order here. We get the reveal that this character is in fact killer. Kid is devastated at what has happened to him, that he's been forced to eat the smile fruit. And then both Kid and Killer, their heads are being held underwater until Luffy dies. And the deal is, Luffy, you're gonna keep fighting until you're dead and their heads will be underwater until you die. Luffy's in a pretty hopeless situation. He has the collar around his neck, which again, I've talked about things really out of order because I've already talked about him escaping from the collar. He's got the collar around his neck. We've got his friends, well, not really friends, but you know, he doesn't want them to die, being held underwater. It feels a little bit hopeless. He can't leave the ring but also he's not allowed to leave the ring until he dies, but also he's really not interested in dying. What are we gonna do? Big Mom shows up. I guess now it's time to talk about Big Mom because I have opinions about this woman. Here's the thing. Big Mom is a character that I really, really loved the potential of. And I really, really liked her for a good chunk of the whole cake island, but I wasn't as in love with her wedding cake side. I didn't love the direction that she took. It's fine. I don't hate it. I'm not mad about it. It just wasn't really my cup of tea. It didn't land quite the same. I don't like this. I don't like what we've done with her here because now she's on hot pursuit. She's in hot pursuit of our straw hats. She's still after killing them. They're now in the land of Wano, which is Kaido's Kaido, I said it right this time, which is Kaido's territory. And Kaido says, if you come in here, I'm gonna kill you. So she comes in here, she's knocked down, and then she washes up on shore in amnesia. Now, I really was okay with the amnesia trope when it first showed up. It's been in some of my favorite books. The Bone Shard Daughter is a great example. Amnesia shows up sometimes and it works out really well. It 
can be handled well, it can be done interestingly. And when we're first introduced to this trope and she's with Chopper, etc., and they're on their way to where Luffy is and they've promised they've given her false promises and we don't know how long the amnesia is gonna last. It actually, I was pretty cool with it because I really like the idea of the tension that this offered. I really like the idea of having an emperor of the sea, not only that, an enemy of yours who is an emperor of the sea who wants to kill you, in your crew, hanging out with your people, and she could literally snap back and regain her memories at any moment. I like that tension. I like that fear factor. I like that that level of she's funny and friendly and it's funny right now, but at any moment she could snap and try to kill us all and do us some serious harm and damage. I really like that tension, but that tension wasn't really explored very much other than just a couple of very quick scenes with Chopper kind of panicking, but he panics about everything and her kind of salivating over her Chopper's existence because she's really, really hungry. So the tension that I was excited about really wasn't, there wasn't much time spent on it. And then once we finally see her in action, she blows through the gates, which opens the gates for Momo and Chopper and all of them, which solves one of their problems, uh, which also distracts things so that Kid and Killer are saved, which also distracts things so that Luffy can just kind of tear his own uh, uh, collar off and also blows open the cell of the mystery shadow character that we haven't actually been introduced to. Then she fights off against Queen. Queen does a head dive into mom's skull and that knock reminds her of who she is and then she just passes out. So her amnesia, so... <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Luffy could have broken the collar without mom's distraction and he could have saved Kid and Killer. It's not like none of these things could have happened without Big Mom. It's just, I don't know. Anyway, then they carry Big Mom off to Kaido and then she and Kaido fight and then they form an alliance, which I'm way ahead of myself now. But honestly, as much as I love Kaido and mom actually having an alliance instead of Kaido actually killing her like he said he would do, when it, which he did try. When he, like he said he would do, like I love their alliance because that only raises the stakes that much higher. It only makes this whole situation seem that much more perilous because not only are we fighting against Kaido, the biggest threat that we've had in this series to date, but now we have Kaido and mom together, two emperors of the sea who are trying to kill Luffy and crew who are trying to continue to suppress the world, or well, suppress Wano. This is a huge deal. This is terrifying. I love this. I love this amping up of tension, this amping up of stakes. I think this is a great alliance. I feel like Oda could have come up with a better way to get her there, though. I mean, she needs to get to Kaido so that they can duke it out and split the skies, just like Pops did. They need to split the skies. <laughs> and then become, and then, and then team up. That's great, awesome, swell. But could you not have come up with a better way to do it than just like, she lost her memories until it was super convenient for her to have her memories again and now it's an alliance. It was just, it just, it didn't feel cohesive or natural, it felt like plot. And I very rarely read One Piece where it feels like plot. It's kind of like when, um, ah, shoot, Pero, Pedo? No, that's not it. Um, the lion turtle guy, when he was, when he had a fake out death and literally the only purpose of it was to remove him from the pl plot long enough for, to make things happen and then put him back in the plot to make things happen. And it just, it felt very unnatural. It felt very much like I need him out of the way for a while. So let's pretend he's dead and then let's put him back when I want him back. That's kind of how this felt to me where it was like, I need to get mom here big mom here, so I'm just gonna remove her memory for a while, we'll have some comedic re relief, we'll have her kind of disrupt this scene, and then we'll just get her where I want her. Like, it just didn't, it didn't feel very natural. And I love where she is now, I love the end result, but the getting there, I don't know, amnesia isn't a great trope. You have to really make it, like, you have to do something really cool to make that work, and I just don't think he did. I just don't think he did something cool with that. Like it was, it was pretty bland. And Oda 
has made me love a lot of tropes that I don't love, which is why when this whole thing was presented to me, I was like, okay, wait, chill. Amnesia is not a great trope, but no worries. We can make this work, right? Like Oda has convinced me more than once on a trope that I don't like. He can make this work. And then like, it just, it, he didn't really do anything interesting with it at all, even a little. And two, also Big Mom is a character that's really, really interesting with, um, with her beginning and with her trauma, her kind of being stuck in, she's in a, she's basically a child's mind stuck in an adult's body is how I see her. And make, like her trauma that kind of makes her trapped in this adolescent mind with all this power is a really fascinating character and I'd love to dig deeper into her and I'm sure we will. We're obviously not done with her character. I'm only talking about this section. Oda has potential to do a lot of amazing things with her character, but only speaking on this section, I don't like what he did with her in this section. I just don't think it was that interesting. He took a bad trope and he didn't do anything interesting with it. So anyway, this whole review is really out of order, but now I wanna talk about the people of Wano because this is something that really really spoke to me about this arc and I think speaks to the themes so much. So we have Luffy who in his mind, if I can free these prisoners, they'll totally be on my side. And he's not used to working with people as hopeless as the people of Wano. And so the scorpion guy just turns to his prisoners and he's like, prisoners, hold him down. And one would think that after everything that they've seen, after how much they, how powerful they've seen Luffy be, the fact that the gates are busted wide open, the fact that Queen is removed from the situation, so many factors, one would think that they'd be like, more of us than him, okay, let's go. But no, instead, whenever the Scorpion guy says, hold him down, they're like, yep, that's what we should do. We submit, we obey. It's all we know anymore because it's all we are capable of at this point. We've been so demoralized and broken down. The people of Wano have had so much stolen from them. They've been so beaten down that at this point they've just lost every shred of hope that they have and they just have obedience because that's all that they think that they have left. And the fact that Scorpion, I'll learn his name for you guys. Daifugo. Daifugo, the fact that when uh, when he pulls out his plague gun and he says, I don't even need to hit Luffy. I just need to hit one of them and it'll spread to him. The fact that he openly announces how disposable he views these people and yet they keep holding on knowing I'm about to be infected with this plague. He's pointing the gun at me and he just said, I'm happy to shoot you because it'll affect him. And they still hold on. That's how beaten down these people are. That's how demoralized these people are. That's how broken, hopeless, and how much, how little they feel they have left to fight for. That's how much has been stolen from them, that they think they have nothing left. And if they are about to get hit by a plague that will kill them in moments and it'll be a terrible death, okay, I guess that's what we're doing now. I do think that that's one of the major themes that Oda's doing in this arc. I think it's the themes that he's doing in this arc have a lot, are very similar to the Knot Island uh, with the toe jams, with the, with the, celestial dragons. But also I think that this right here, what he's doing, what he's showing in the citizens of Wano, how broken, how beaten down, how hopeless they are, I think is a big thing that he's focusing on here. And as well as on, you know, on the other side of that coin, the, the powers, the way the people in power have chosen to lead, I think is a really big theme. Actually, I'll, I'll expand on that more in a minute, but sorry, my phone fell, that's where I have my notes. I'm very organized. The way the people in power in Wano break down and demoralize their people to keep them submissive is probably one of, not the darkest, but one of the darkest things I've seen in One Piece in a really long time, maybe to date. The way they abuse them and, and make them feel that they have nothing left to fight for and the way that they believe that. I mean, we've seen leaders in One Piece 
around every corner trying to break down the people, trying to force them into submission. But here it's actually worked. Here it's actually succeeded. These people have given up. And that's really devastating. You know, like the country of Wano that I've been expecting to be in for a while now, that Oda has been teasing for so long. The country of Wano that I thought was going to be this great nation is beaten down and broken and given up. That's devastating. I mean, not only that, not only are they so beat down, but they're basically just experimental subjects at this point with the plague, uh, them testing out weapons on them, them, the fact that the Shogun just developed a fascination with the smile fruits, the defective smile fruits, and just gave it to them. They're basically experiments at this point, kind of like the kids in Punk Hazard. By the way, the fact that Doflamingo and Caesar saw the effects, saw the, the defects in the smile fruit, saw that it failed so cata catastrophically that it wasn't good enough to be used and the people that it failed on, that it put this curse on them and their response was to call it the smile fruit, to mock the people that are cursed. Man, I hate Doflamingo. Man, I hate that man. And Caesar. Caesar sucks too. I hate you, Caesar. <sighs> Oda can write a villain. Hmm. Anyway, these people have been infected with plagues. They're basically plague zombies at this way. And then uh, at this point, and then Luffy saying them all being surrounded, not really knowing what to do. And then Luffy touching them by choice, every one of them, reaching his arms around and touching every single person and saying, I'm not affected by this. And Chopper, wasn't it Chopper that said, stop lying, <laughs> yes you are, stop touching them. But Luffy refused. He touched every single one of them and he said, you call this devastation? You call this overwhelming power? This stuff has no effect on me. Open your eyes. You're nothing but slaves. I made a promise with a friend named Tama who fed me in curry, who fed me back in curry. I promise to make this a place where you can eat your fill again. We came here to fight Kaido and win. In a land where these people are so beaten down and broken and demoralized, you have Luffy, a natural leader, someone who throughout this entire series, people are just compelled to follow. People just can't help themselves but stand behind him. Someone who says to people, don't follow me, you're not a part of my crew, but yet an entire fleet is so loyal to him. Luffy, who touches the plague infected to get their attention, then ties up the trunk of the elephant crotch guy and blows him up <laughs> with the plague gun and then turns to them and says, you get the rest. And then Momo enters, Momo happens to be there. And he's the hope that these people need. These hopeless people who have lost every reason to fight, they see Momo, Momo and they bow. Through Luffy, because of Luffy, they took one step towards their own freedom and then their hope walked in the door. I mean, what a powerful moment. Luffy fighting so hard to make these people wake up and realize that you're fighting for nothing and, and convincing them to take just one step to fight for themselves. And then their hope arrives. The hope that they were sure was dead. I mean, you guys, like, this is incredible. I really want to dig in for a little while on these two characters that meant so much to me. Ashura and Kawamatsu. So Kawamatsu, the one that was in the prison for so long, the frog. What an incredible character. I barely know him yet. I can't wait to get to know him more. But what an incredible character. 
someone who was one of Odin's loyal followers, who wanted to see his will accomplished, who wanted to fight for him to the very end. And when he disappeared, he was willing and ready to wait for 20 years, but he was imprisoned. And so for 20 years, he's stuck in this dark, isolated cell where he's mocked and where he's completely alone and where he's fed rotten fish, but yet he perseveres, keeping on, holding on to hope that Momo will return. Razo, um, is it Kitamon? Ket Foxfire, that they will return and restore Wano, that this is not over. Him persevering all these years and, and, with, and maintaining his hope, plus on top of that, him raising Kiori after everybody else, after her father and her mother died, after her brother disappeared, her remaining and him raising her up. Even when we got that flashback and she left him and him looking for her and then whenever she explains why and he's just so happy and he's like, how sweet of you. Truly, like every panel that this character gets when his face is on the panel and he's not just this dark shadowy figure, I love him. Him maintaining hope the entire time but then Ashura Doji, the opposite of him in some ways, he was not imprisoned. He was not removed. He was not isolated. He watched this country rapidly decline. He watched it be industrialized, polluted, destroyed. X Drake came in and destroyed the place. Ka 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 Kaido and the Shogun um, created this even greater social divide. The people starved and suffered. The people were cursed. He watched this country die. And the moment when he faces them, Foxfire and them, and he says, why did it take you 20 years? And Foxfire didn't even have an answer for him. And he just said, what did he say? I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the line. It was something along the lines of, we'll just have to wait and see. He didn't even have an answer for him. This man who waited 20 years and became bitter and calloused and cold and who was so angry. And he said, why did it take you 20 years? He watched his country die. And yet he collected the ships and he collected, collected the map. He still finished his task. He was still loyal to Odin's mission, even though he was mad and he was bitter and he was hurting and he didn't understand why we were doing this and why it had to happen this way. He still accomplished his task. He still maintained his loyalty. He was just not perfect. And like what an honest representation of two people that had to remain loyal in the face of hopelessness. One, hopelessness of being alone and poisoned and mocked and maintaining that stature and maintaining that hope. And one, who had to watch his country die and watch leaders rise up that didn't deserve that position, who were torturing the people. And he became callous and bitter, but he didn't stop being loyal. I don't know guys, like these two characters really, really speak to me. These two characters, they're two types of loyalty are incredible to me. And I, both of these characters I have endeared, I have become endeared to over in, in such a short period of time. And I'm so excited to see more from them. In the midst of all this also, man, I'm not even thinking about Law, but his, uh, his crewmates, three, I believe, of his crewmates were captured by Hawkins and their souls were tied to him so that if Law fought Hawkins, he would uh, be killing his own crewmates. So he went and I believe he basically offered himself up to Hawkins in exchange for his crewmates' lives. So then he was chained up, but the next time we saw him, he was taking down Hawkins. So that didn't work out so well for him. So I'm excited, well, it didn't work out so well for Hawkins, I mean. I'm excited to see what we're gonna get from Law in the next uh, section, because in this act, we didn't get a lot of him, but what little bits we got, 
have me really excited for what's to come with him. Oh, I forgot to mention when I was talking about Kawamatsu and all the wonderful things that he is, he also, through all that, he, uh, he remained loyal before he was imprisoned in trying to, to preserve the weapons and trying to, you know, that, that, um, fox that was guarding the graves. He, through his intense loyalty, won over the loyalty of the fox, and they were able to take these, uh, the swords of the, uh, of, from the graves saying, no, we'll preserve their will. We'll, we won't let them be stolen by the enemy. We'll put them to good use. And they took them and they buried them under, well, put them underground, and because of that, now our army is equipped because the people of Wano aren't allowed to have weapons, but because of what Kawamatsu, because of what Kawamatsu did back before he was imprisoned, because of his loyalty, because of him, we have weapons so we can fight Kaido. And yeah, we're still totally ill-equipped, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Again, kind of drawing back to the themes that I'm not even sure about, but that seem like what's what Oda's kind of honing in on here. Um, we have we have Ka Kaido, who again, as I've already exhaustively discussed, is trying to rule with an iron fist and is harming his people, trying trying to rule through force and through pain and through stealing every ounce of hope that they have. He's now teamed up with Mom, who, with Big Mom, who also ruled terribly. Um, and her, we spent a lot of time seeing her people, her subordinates, um, whether it be people or like trees and clouds, their uh, loyalty wavering from her as well, because again, she ruled with an iron fist. She ruled in a really terrible way. She did a bad job. And so her subjects, some of them were loyal to her, some of them weren't, and they wavered. We're seeing the same thing happen with Kaido, where he has so demoralized his people, but their loyalty is wavering. Then we have Luffy, who people are just, they can't help themselves but follow because he is a different kind of leader. He is a different kind of ruler. He's not a ruler. Leader was the right word. I don't know why I tried to build on that. Because he's the type that comes in and is genuinely after the good of the people. So people who are used to being ruled and threatened and forced to submit, they see Luffy, a true leader, a real leader, someone who actually wants to help them, and naturally their loyalties waver. So yes, we're faced off against two emperors of the sea, two of the strongest people we've met so far. And yes, it does look absolutely impossible, but we have this very extreme contrast between these two types of leaders, between these emperors of the sea and between Luffy. And I think what we're going to see is even more of what we've already seen, of more rallying behind him. And essentially, an entire nation rising up behind Luffy to fight these two, because hope is being restored. And honestly, like, maybe I'm wrong about it all, but honestly, the setup here is already so emotional and so powerful. Like, really what Oda is doing here is kicking me in the heart over and over and over again. It's already been such a powerful setup, and I just cannot wait to see how he's gonna follow this through. Then, of course, we also have lots of really cool setup for just great action that's to come, like with Zoro um, getting the new sword, and the fact that it has the power to, what was it, cut down heaven, cut down the heavens and, and, and cut through down to hell or something like that. That's really cool. It reminds me of Fujitora and his powers. It's not anything like that, but that's a really, well, the two swords, the two swords can do that and Zoro only got one, but that's amazing. Zoro got a big level up with that new sword and um, not only that, but uh, the clues that we're getting. I really don't know what to do with it, honestly, with Zoro teaching Momo that new word, and then Momo being scolded, like, don't do that, that's for the ancient samurais, or something like that. And then Zoro says, oh yeah, I've never actually said that, I just heard it from this old guy in my village. Who are you, old guy? And what is your purpose? Are you an old samurai? What's going on? I don't even know. 
there's so many little things happening that have been sprinkled all throughout this arc that just kind of are very exciting to see where the payoff is going to come from, but I don't know how to properly break those down and still be able to get all the other things that I want to talk about in this video too. It's a lot, a lot happened in these 30 chapters and it's very overwhelming and it's very emotional. And honestly, after finishing just two acts in this five act, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be five acts, arc, I'm just, I'm blown away already at what Oda is setting up for. <sighs> I don't know, this is gonna be really good. Anyway, I've been talking for far too long. Don't forget to check out Bright Sellers. I really like their wine and also chat with me more in the comments. I post videos every Tuesday and Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.